Anmol Chada, Research Director at the Institute for the Future. Maya Rocky Moore Cummings, Founder, CEO, and President of Global Policy Solutions. Bradley Hardy, Associate Professor of Public Administration and Policy at American University. Cecilia Munoz, Vice President for Public Interest Technology and Local Initiatives at New America. And Tom Perriello, Executive Director of Open Society Foundation. Great, thank you guys for having us. <laughs> so my, I'm Anmol Chad, I, I lead the uh, Equitable Futures Lab, which is a project of the Institute for the Future based in California. And I realized that the Equitable Futures Lab is essentially the Bay Area or Silicon Valley translation of the Center for Equitable Growth, hmm. right? So you guys have a center, we're a lab, got the equitable, equitable, growth, futures, the same, 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 same thing. except our upstairs uh, neighbors, there's Tinder, who works right upstairs from us in Palo <laughs> I think it's probably a little bit different than the equitable growth office. Um, but with, uh, with that in mind, um, I want to introduce this Fantastic panel. I'll start from the, the, the far side over there with um, Tom, and I'll keep the intros pretty short because I know we have a brief amount of time for the actual panel session. Uh, Tom, of course, is the director of Open Society US. He previously served as the CEO of Center for American Progress Action and was a co-founder of avaza.org. Um, was a former member of Congress representing Virginia's 5th District. Cecilia Munoz is um, vice president for public interest technology and local initiatives and New America. Prior to that, she served for eight years in the Obama administration, um, partly as the director of the Domestic Policy Council. Bradley Hardy, this is associate professor of public administration and policy at American University, non-resident senior fellow at Brookings, and also a visiting scholar at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, Center on Household Financial Stability. And then Maya Rocky Moore Cummings, founder, president, and CEO of Global Policy Solutions, formerly with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, National Urban League, Chief of Staff to Congressman Charles Rangel, staff of House Ways and Means, previous legislative fellow in, in, in Congress as well. So please welcome our panelists here. And I'd like to actually give Maya a few moments to, to, um, to offer some thoughts or comments about your, your late husband. Yeah, so good morning. Is it still morning? Um, I, I am just, Delighted uh, to give a few brief remarks about uh, the late Congressman Elijah Cummings. I just got a note from a colleague at the Aspen Institute who said that, you know, in all her years of knowing me, she never know, knew that we were married <laughs> 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 until the funeral. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that, um, you know, we've known each other over 20 years. Uh, when I first got to Washington in 1997, he was one of the first members of Congress I met. He gave me an interview for my dissertation on the African-American political response to HIV AIDS. I labeled him a transformational leader uh, in my dissertation. Uh, but we became fast friends, and then it evolved into a relationship and then a marriage. Uh, it is it's with seer, sincere sadness uh, that uh, he passed um, a little over a week ago. And um, the fact of the matter is, is he spent, even though people per perhaps most remember him uh, as a great defender of democracy, uh, because in our democracy, in the pr promise of our democracy, he saw liberation for people of all different backgrounds, particularly those who have been oppressed uh, and marginalized in our society. This is a man who spent most of his career uh, focused on how do we break the structural dynamics that keep people from achieving all that they're meant to achieve and keep them from uh, contributing to the prosperity of America and enjoying in the prosperity of America. And that was informed by his own gr uh, growing up uh, in Baltimore, uh, where he grew up in the Jim Crow South, um, where the geospatial uh, dynamics uh, were such that, you know, African Americans were concentrated in certain locations. They were told that they couldn't go to any other schools except the designated schools. And so what you had was an entire structure, and what you still have, by the way, and I'll get to that, is an entire structure uh, that's basically um, designed uh, to keep people from opportunity. So when we're talking about structural change, and by the way, it hasn't much changed because if you look at the dynamics of Baltimore today, and Raj Chetty and his colleagues have done some great work about the lack of opportunity uh, in places like Baltimore, 
you still continue to see the same geospatial dynamics. So with that, what I just want to say is, is that he was a great champion uh, for uh, equitable growth. Uh, and so we must all continue his legacy. And I thank you for the opportunity to share. Great. Thank you. And I do think this seems, this panel is uh, focused on structural inequality is, uh, and structural changes. Seems like a, a very appropriate way to honor that legacy as well. Um, so just as some context, so first I was, I was asked to remind people to submit questions through the platform and also I think there's now a requirement to put your name in there, so I don't know if people were trolling the platform before with <coughs> questions um, or people were at setting up questions to ask themselves when they got here. I don't know if Bradley, that was uh, part of the strategy. Um, but um, that's not going to happen this time. Uh, so. But just for basic context for this conversation on, um, on, on structural change around inequality, we know we're in the longest economic expansion that's ever been recorded in, in our history. Uh, we have extraordinarily low unemployment rates uh, by historical standards. I think today just ticked up to 3.6% nationally. Of course, the black unemployment rate is higher, 5.4%, um, which is about what the white employment rate was five years ago. Um, and at the same time, we have a very tight labor market, very strong economy in terms of aggregate measures of growth, and the most recent census or ACS data show that we have the highest level of inequality that has ever been recorded as well. So that's just a sort of, that's the basic high level context, and I wanted to start off and kick it off with, with Bradley to talk a little bit about um, our research on economic mobility and the big picture there, and if you could start actually by listing out or, or sort of your three key points or three big takeaways that you'd want people to 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 take away from the, the story you want to tell. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think that much of what I'm going to say echoes uh, much of what Maya led off with, uh, frankly, that, look, to start off, um, you know, economic mobility, it, just how children are faring relative to their parents, um, you know, it's fairly low in the U.S. on average, the ability of kids to move up the economic ladder. And so we just have more and more uh, quantitative evidence uh, of this fact. And that research body uh, in economics is you know, roughly 30 to 40 years old. And, and so um, interestingly, we've seen these mobility trends. Too. Yeah, it is. And sociology yeah. as well. Yeah. And sociology. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I can come back to that yeah. later. That's exactly. <laughs> There's a cross-disciplinary literature. Right, right. This. Exactly. So uh, you know, it's interesting. It's worsened. Uh, throughout the 1980s. So my birth cohort, uh, you know, 8082, um, has done worse on mobility uh, outcomes, right? And, and so um, returns to education have gone up, so inequitable access to that's going to drive it, inequality going up. Mm -hmm. That's a big driver. Uh, access to uh, the bundle of great things in higher quality neighborhoods, mm -hmm. i.e. safety, uh, high quality schools, these sorts of things uh, matter quite a bit. Uh, and so we just know that family background matters. Um, the ability of parents to uh, purchase those resources, um, you know, parental education and income matter greatly. Now, so that'd be one point. Um, you know, the second point would just be that, you know, frankly, the transmission of economic status does have a, a very clear demographic and geographic gradient, right? So one, um, uh, low mobility uh, is worse for black Americans. It's worse in the Southeast. Uh, I'm born, raised, and educated in the South. I love the South, so I'm not trying to pick on the South, but uh, those are the, the statistical facts. Um, there is variation, though, within even cities that look bad. Uh, there's pockets of upward uh, mobility, um, you know, neighborhoods where folks are doing better than others, right? Uh, so it depends on the, the snapshot you take. Um, but we got to take a look at public policies there, and I know the, the panel will get into this. Um, you know, there's clear differences, things like um, access to supplemental earned income credits, minimum wages, union protections, so on and so forth. And then just, you know, finally, I just say that, you know, as a fact, you know, economic inequality and the low mobility that it's causing, it's not inevitable. Uh, I, th I think we know across social sciences that uh, the safety net works to improve long-term outcomes. Resources matter for higher educational attainment, uh, closing racial uh, educational gaps, so on and so forth. Uh, so there's a lot that we can do. There's a lot that works. There's a lot that we can improve upon. Yeah, that's great. So I think the, the social safety net, the, you know, you close with that. You mentioned that briefly at the end. I think, Maya, your work touches on this as well, right? The, 
and especially the real lived experiences of people who work in class Americans as well and dealing with social insurance programs. So can you, is there, how would you, you know, could you add to that picture that Bradley's painted and how would social insurance and social safety net programs? Right, I'm a, a proud member of the National Academy of Social Insurance. I think Bill is in the back there, wave Bill. Um, but we have, we've done a lot of work uh, throughout the years. Since I arrived in Washington in 1997, I worked on the House Ways and Means Social Security Subcommittee. Uh, so I've worked on Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, um, all of the social insurance programs. Uh, and, and really what we find is despite historical discrimination in some programs like Social Security, uh, these programs are a, a wonderful uh, support mechanism, particularly for low-income uh, populations, uh, and have been uh, a way for particularly low-income populations of color uh, to actually get the resources that they need to sustain themselves. Uh, in the circumstances that they find themselves. So if we're talking about Medicaid or Social Security. Um, uh, so, you know, one aspect, for example, of Social Security is people think of it as an old age program. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is this one of the, the nation's largest anti-poverty programs for children. Uh, that's especially important for children of color. Uh, and so when you look at the data, you know, we've done research that shows that approximately the, the Social Security Administration reports that they have 3.2 million children that they're supporting through Social Security, but when you actually look at the family unit uh, who's actually living in a household, and uh, many children in a, of low income status live in extended family households where someone is getting a Social Security check, when you include that broader data, uh, you understand that that number actually doubles uh, to 6.2 million of American children. So, the, you know, across the board, um, social insurance programs play an incredibly important role, as do other important safety net programs like, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, lunch program, the school lunch program, uh, breakfast programs that are evolving, et cetera. So these are important uh, and we should, of course, I know that you wouldn't, uh, but, you know, the nation shouldn't uh, ignore their importance uh, for making sure that there is some measure of economic stability in lower income households. That's great. So we talked a bit about economic mobility at sort of a macro level um, and then the social policy component as well, right? And I think one of the things that's hanging over this is, what, is especially what's going on in the labor market, right? And so Cecilia, I was hoping that you could speak a bit about the work that you've been doing around um, skills and job, job training programs and especially around how those are being implemented in some of those shortcomings. Yeah, thank you. So thank you very much. I should point out that I have colleagues sitting in the room from New America, Bridget Schulte, who leads our Better Life Lab, and Amanda Lenhart, who's a co-author of a study that, that we're about to release, and I promise not to scoop it, but I'm going to talk about it a little bit. Um, so we're in a conversation about, about work, about the quality of jobs, which is tremendously important, but also about the ways in which work is changing, that, that, that the nature of work is changing, the impact that automation is going to have on the workforce. And we're at, I work at New America now, and we're trying to um, focus in on making sure that we're actually engaging the workers who are going to be affected by this in the conversation about what it means and what we might do about it. Um, and so Amanda has co-led a research study where we talk to a bunch of workers who are in sectors of the economy that are likely to be affected by automation. And it turns out, first of all, that when we, when we talk about sort of the future of work and what automation is going to do, the coverage tends to focus on factory floors and truck drivers, occupations uh, held um, uh, traditionally by men. What the data shows is that there's a disproportionate impact likely to be felt by women, office workers, retail workers, um, particularly women of color. And so, um, and so that's who we went and talked to. And there, it, it's it, interesting to me that there is so much focus, and rightfully so, on making sure that we're providing workers with the skills that they're going to need in the, in the kind of tech, uh, in technology, in the kind of economy that we're building. So there's a vast conversation about kind of delivering training programs for workers, which I think is important. But when we talk to workers themselves, there's a real skepticism. I mean, I think the, the assumption that everybody's going to need to learn how to code is not the answer to um, making sure that we have workers who are adequately prepared for the kind of economy that we're building. Um, and there's a lot of skepticism about training programs in general, in part because workers are living lives and they, you know, they have jobs, they have children, they have transportation needs, they have other needs, which means that they, what they said to us was that we're much more interested in kind of, if there it needs to be training, we're much more interested in it happening in, in our jobs rather than separately. Um, and we heard some very interesting skepticism about, 
if what this means is that I need to train to become a manager, I'm not sure that's actually what I want in my life because those people have even less control over their lives and their time and their schedules than I do. So that suggests to me that there's a real mismatch between where the conversation is going and who the people are that this conversation is about and what they want and need and are interested in. And that suggests to me that if we're going to be developing policy and delivering policy, we really should be doing it in collaboration with the people who are the point of the policy making exercise in the first place. Um, and one of the things that Carmen Rojas said earlier that really resonated with me is that we, when you, if you start with technology, very frequently you're asking the wrong question. But what we're learning is that if you bring the skills of technologists to this question, um, we have tools that allow us to engage people in the design of the policy which affects them. And for all of the conversations that we're having today, we should be using those tools. We, uh, it's important that we do research, that we do analysis, that we go where the data takes us, and it's equally important that we engage the folks who are at the point of this exercise in the first place because we now have tools that can allow them to help us design the things which are going to affect them, and we should, we should use them. Yeah, and, we'll, and, then, and also what are the underlying ideas that are shaping those policies, right? So it's not just a, like a technical fix, right, but led by engineers. Right? Well, well, exactly. I mean, I think we, and I say this lovingly as a, you know, career policymaker, of course we're trying to make policy on the basis of what the evidence tells us. Um, but a lot of what we do is guessing, um, and, and we don't have to. Um, and we don't do nearly enough to engage um, the folks who we're talking about, yeah. and we will get to better results if we do. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. I want to come back to that because we, uh, in California, part of what we're doing is we're coordinating the uh, California Future of Work Commission that the governor created this year, and there are a few convenings into that. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that I want to pull back to you on with that. I want to give Tom a chance to jump in here. Um, and, and, you know, we are we're, we want to talk about structural changes, right, and, and, and structural reforms, um, especially with, with the building on the labor market conversations, right, that Cecilia laid out. So how do you see, what do you, for you, from your vantage point where you, where you work and, 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 and the, the activities that you're engaged in, what's the, what are the opportunities for structural reform? What are the challenges now? Um, do you see the economic context or political context working providing a window of opportunity for that, or is, it, is that window closing? What do you think? Um, <clears throat> so first of all, let me just say to, <clears throat> um, to Maya, uh, when I got to Congress, um, Chairman Cummings was incredibly um, kind to everyone who was a first member, like first year helped mentor a lot of us. And whenever we had a tough vote, so many members would point to the polling numbers or whatever else. And whenever I would ask him for advice on a tough vote, he said, listen to your constituents and then follow your conscience. And he was just an unbelievable uh, mentor to so many of us <clears throat> on the Hill. So I just really want to uh, express my appreciation there. Um, I think we need to understand, and I think it's come up in several parts of the conversation, the interrelationships of power. Uh, economic power, corporate power with democratic power and with racial power. Um, and we see right now an unbelievable concentration of wealth, but that concentration of wealth is able to translate itself into economic, uh, into political power that affects the ability to produce results for people, for the very parties that want to build power or organizations that want to build power by being able to show that they are standing up for working class people, uh, middle class folks of all races. And we have to start you know, bluntly from a reality that there are very few examples through human history, including American history, of multiracial democracy existing with genuine equality of voice. Um, we have had lots of hierarchies, whether by tribe or sect uh, or elsewhere uh, or other types around the world. But to sustain that kind of multi-identity democracy is difficult in part because of how people play and divide those with power can divide it in order to prevent the building of power. And so we're really looking both at this question uh, of corporate monopolistic power right now, both in its traditional forms, uh, of which we have a great deal, along with this new generation of uh, monopolies that are also adding control of information, uh, both private and public, into those spaces. Um, and so the challenge is great. On the flip side, I would actually say there has never been this much multiracial majoritarian support 
for the kind of reforms that many of us are talking about, whether that's reimagining capitalism, reimagining sectoral bargaining, whether that's reimagining a living wage. Uh, I'm not a UBI fan, but that type of conversation, right? You're having a set of conversations right now about much bolder reforms, many of them with a lens of power on them. So I think we have these multi, um, uh, th these intersecting forces of either concentration of power versus democratizing of power that we see, uh, including in the philanthropic sector, which I think has rightly come, come into a fair amount of criticism, both of how it operates, but also how its use can justify some of the more uh, unequal economic policies um, uh, that get put out there. Um, so we do need this, uh, to, to many of the things that were put out there, it's absolutely essential for building power to be able to deliver results in a governing sector. And I think that's why cities have been so interesting is to some extent it's been a little easier to see innovators there break through some of these systems. But power does pull back. Uh, our organization was involved in helping to get a number of reformist prosecutors elected um, across the country, uh, many of them women of color, and the system is doing everything they can to prevent them from succeeding, uh, whether that's people in their own offices or police or otherwise. So again, that desire, understanding that if people are able to basically access power and then deliver results in that space, that builds additional power and credibility for the kind of structural reforms or reimaginings that we like. And so I think whereas progressives and liberals, which I'm guessing are the majority of people in the room, we're very much rationalists, right? Like we think we can get a white paper out there and data and we absolutely should do that. Um, but the other side tends to think in terms of power. So I think it's not about rejecting reason and fact, we absolutely should be driven by that, um, but also understanding that uh, the other side's playing a slightly different game on this and we need to understand how our work um, lands within that. Wow, yeah, that's sharp. It's so yeah, that's I mean, that's sharp. So that's uh, that's a it's a good perspective on thing on, on framing these issues across the border. So this applies across the labor market issues, across economic mobility and neighborhoods and education and those institutions as well as social safety net, social policy as well. Um, Carmen Rojas earlier had said something about um, around innovation and work, right, and and how that's being framed. <coughs> what, what's usually talked about around innovation and and uh, Cecilia, you were talking a little bit about the future of our conversations as well. Um, and I think that for uh, you know the the commission that we're doing in California, we it's uh, whereas the up till now a lot of the future work conversations had focused so much on technology and automation and the you know mm -hmm. the threat of job displacement from robots um, and it's partly this work is now being driven by uh, to, to shape a vision around uh, economic equity in California, mm -hmm. right? And I think around. Um, Rather than asking what uh, what sorts of jobs or work are we going to have to be doing in the future for robots for our robot managers, right? <laughs> what sort of the, the questions that we want to be asking? <coughs> what is it that we want work and jobs to be doing for us, right? And how do we chart a path to getting there? Um, and so one of the things that, that the commission has really been wrestling with, and I just mentioned that the New America folks from California have been really involved in this as well. And I know they've been doing a lot of great research and projects around the state, especially in the Central Valley and the places that are. Uh, that, that, don't, that, don't, that typically don't get as much attention as the coastal cities. Um, but one of the things that they're wrestling with around work is um, in, in terms of strategies to improve the outcomes for, for low wage workers, right? We can think of, in, in very loose terms, two broad sets of strategies. One that focuses very much on upgrading workers themselves, primarily through skills and training. Um, and then another approach that will focus on upgrading jobs themselves, which are not necessarily mutually exclusive, but sort of analytically it's kind of, it's useful to separate because they do emphasize different points of intervention. Um, so from your, from your perspective and your point, is, is this question on job quality, I should also mention that, you know, this is something you mentioned last week, uh, there's this great research that came out from Gallup and uh, with Omidyar and Gates, some other groups, right, that on, on job quality in the United States for the first time putting real concrete numbers on this. And in this context of strong economic growth, low unemployment, they also found that only 40% of American workers are in what would be defined as good jobs, right? So the majority of all workers across all income groups are in either mediocre or poor jobs. Right. Um, so how do we think about this, this emphasis on either upskilling workers at the individual level versus looking at jobs themselves as maybe a different approach for structural change? So this is an incredibly important point, and I was um, 
um, struck actually by the chart that Heather showed at the beginning that w like what it might mean if we look at economic growth but it disaggregated in a way that allows us to see who it's affecting and who it's not affecting because it is true right that we're in the labor market that we're that we're in and we're in the economy that we're in but to the extent that this is a boom I think certainly when I go back to Michigan which is where I'm from and talk to people about whether they are experiencing it as a boom the answer to that is very clearly no and that's echoed around the country and at some level the data really shows us this. So, uh, and it, it, this is part of the reason it isn't enough to talk about making sure that people are prepared for jobs that we assume will be higher quality jobs uh, and the jobs which are gonna come into the economy that like haven't been invented yet. We also know that some of the sectors of the economy that are growing where there are going to be jobs and jobs that are not automatable are also jobs that are kind of not sustainable for the people who are in them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, another one of the things that we're that we're hearing coming out of this report that I'm sort of previewing, and you should come to New America on November 21st to hear more, <laughs> um, is that people are leaving jobs that they love uh, in order to move into jobs that they don't love so much but that they feel that are more secure. And the jobs that they love are caregiving jobs. Mm -hmm. And there are gonna be more of those, not less of those. And we have not yet figured out how to way to make sure that they pay sufficiently um, and that they provide the kind of flexibility that human beings need in order to be the human beings that they need to be. Um, and so this notion, and this is, I say this with all humility because my colleagues who know more about this are sitting right there, but this notion of better jobs being both about wages but, and, but also the capacity to live your life and care for your children or your parents or God forbid yourself um, needs to be built into our notion of what equity means and what kind of economy we want to build. Mm -hmm. We really need to be thinking about kind of human-centered capitalism, if you will, to make sure that um, as, we, as we devise these policy ideas, as we try to create momentum and build power um, to, to become the kind of society and economy that we want to become, that we think of this in terms of wages, but we also think of this in terms of flexibility and people's ability to live their lives. Yeah, that's great. So I'd like to just uh, challenge the paradigm of employer-centered uh, job improvement. Uh, because I think that's the conversation that we're having in the political realm right now. Uh, and when you see the proposals that are being offered from some of the um, perhaps more left-leaning uh, presidential candidates, you see what they're offering is an expansion of social insurance. Uh, because we know that the nature of um, you know, capitalism and uh, employers as they are now uh, is that they're, you know, they're shedding benefits. Uh, and so the question becomes is how do you actually assure people access to the things that they need to live their best lives outside of what the job opportunities are. Uh, and so uh, we've, we're, we're hearing about, you know, Medicare for all. We're hearing about, you know, some people are talking about universal basic income. Uh, all of this is outside of the context. And of course, we know that half of the jobs in the, in the United States of America, uh, people don't have access to tax preferred retirement accounts through their jobs. And that means an expansion of Social Security as well as a way to get portable benefits, regardless of what your employment, uh, your, who, who your employer is or what your employment circumstances are. So I think that is the wave and the moment that we're in right now. Uh, and so, you know, it's a, a critical moment, one where we have to understand the broad range of tools uh, and then how we actually structure society and the assets that we have, the public assets that we have, uh, to meet the needs of families in the 21st century. That's great. So would you say then, do you, would, do you think there's a, uh, either a push or, or, or interest then in, in moving towards decoupling a lot of these key benefits or things that people would expect from employment away from the traditional employer-employee mm -hmm. relationship onto either whether it's state programs or, or, or Yes, and that's, that's what I'm arguing. And the other component of that is, is that then, you know, you know, many of these employers are operating in an international competitive context. Uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that once, you know, we have this shift, if it happens, and it looks like it may, um, that they actually become more competitive. Um, as a small business owner, I, I know that, you know, it was not, it was not, uh, you know, the, it was not welcoming for me uh, to have to manage, uh, you know, employee health care uh, or even retirement programs. Mm -hmm. Uh, and to the extent that you know we can free uh, employers from that uh, burdensome obligation, uh, then we're doing right by employers, and we're also doing to the extent we expand the social safety net and uh, social insurance in a way that is robust, then we have an opportunity to really 
uh, make sure that um, uh, people are taken care of as well. All right, and I can imagine that some, so one question that some may ask or, or, or in, in reaction to that, right, is that right now there are, to some extent, there are people in traditional uh, employment relationships with employers that may provide benefits, right, that provide health coverage, and that's part of their sort of total compensation. So how do we think about moving towards this system um, in a way that doesn't let employers off the hook from what they are either currently providing or what they should, what people expect them to be providing. And again, this is a part of the conversation. You've heard it in the national debates that we've had over the last uh, several presidential debates. And this is whole, this whole notion of, you know, if you do, if you're one of the half of the, po if you're part of the half of the population that has access to these great benefits to your job, and you want to keep them, um, you know, how do we transition uh, to providing basic 